Hello and welcome to the Parkinson's Foundation's Wellness Wednesday webinar. Today we will talk about Parkinson's 101, what you and your family should know. Please share in the chat where you are joining from today and say hello to your Parkinson's community. I'm joining you today from Western North Carolina in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Please know that we are recording today's presentation and you will receive a follow-up email from us with a link to today's recording and other resources in the coming days. Before we, be, we begin the formal webinar, I'd like to share a little bit about the Parkinson's Foundation. The Parkinson's Foundation is a nonprofit focused on bettering the lives of those living with Parkinson's through improving care and advancing research. Everything we do is in close concert with our community to ensure that our actions are aligned with the needs and priorities of those living with PD. To achieve our mission, we pursue three goals. We are focused on improving care for those living with PD, advancing research toward a cure, and empowering our global community. Today's program is an example of one of the things we are doing to help us meet these goals. If you're looking to get more involved, we're excited to share our initiative meant to capture the community's perspective on various topics in Parkinson's. We hope that you'll join us by signing up for this initiative where we invite you to complete a 10, maybe 20 minute survey on topics such as mental health, telehealth, and the experiences of our care partners. We will always report findings back to the community. You can learn more at parkinson.org slash PF surveys. Today's PD Health at Home program is presented by the Light of Day Foundation. We want to take this moment to thank the Light of Day Foundation for supporting the mission of the Parkinson's Foundation. The Parkinson's Foundation provides weekly educational and wellness programs virtually through our PD Health at Home series, including Mindfulness Mondays, Wellness Wednesdays, and Fitness Fridays, as well as our expert briefings and EP Salud en Casa. As a reminder, all programs are held at the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. You can learn more and register for these programs by visiting parkinson.org slash pdhealth. As we close announcements, we settle in for our webinar on Parkinson's 101, what you and your family should know. This program will provide a basic overview of Parkinson's disease. We will learn what Parkinson's is, what causes it, common symptoms, treatments, and strategies for managing symptoms. We will also hear from two people living with Parkinson's disease. I'd like to share a bit about our speaker today. Kelly McWilliams is a Parkinson's nurse navigator at Corwell Health in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is a Parkinson's Foundation comprehensive care center. In her role, Kelly provides education to individuals newly diagnosed with Parkinson's, supports individual and family care needs over the course of Parkinson's, and serves as a Parkinson's Foundation Ambassador and Care Center Coordinator. Kelly has been a registered nurse for 20 years and has supported PD care for three and a half years in her current role. She will complete her advanced practice nursing graduate education at Michigan State University this summer. Upon graduation, she plans to continue supporting people and families impacted by PD by fostering education, resources and community connections, as well as focus on quality improvement initiatives to improve care for the PD community. It is with great honor to welcome our speaker today, Kelly McWilliams. Thanks for being here, Kelly. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. We are pleased to be here today and so excited to see uh, various people joining from all across the country. Um, my video is not letting me open up the camera if you're able to um, allow that. Thank you. Perfect. So thank you for being here, everyone. I'm going to pull up my slides and we will get started. Let's bear with me one moment. I'm trying one more time to get my slides up. So hold on one second, please. OK, 
Kelly, pull them back up and then um, I'll see if I can guide you through it. You're almost there. <laughs> it's showing that it's up, but it's not fully displaying on my screen for some you reason. Do you see my slides? Yep. Can you go to the top left corner? It says from current slide. Click that button there. It's really not on my primary screen, oh. but let me see if I can okay. get it. How's that? Perfect. Looks okay. Thank you. That should be the hardest part today. So thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, as introduced, my name is Kelly. I'm a nurse. I support Parkinson's care at Corwell Health. Uh, we are located in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So we're right near Lake Michigan. Um, and as mentioned, we are a Parkinson's Foundation Comprehensive Care Center. So we partner with the foundation as much as possible because this organization offers wonderful resources for the Parkinson's community. Um, today, we are going to talk about Parkinson's disease. And again, this is a general overview. Uh, we're going to cover what is Parkinson's disease, what causes the disease that we know of, what are the common symptoms, and how do we manage those symptoms, and a little bit about research. And then I'm going to spend some time talking to two individuals under our care at Corwell Health. So Parkinson's disease is considered a chronic progressive brain disorder. Um, there is not currently a cure for the um, disease yet, but we can manage symptoms very effectively. So a lot of our focus for conversation today will be about engaging in your own care and how we can partner with you as providers on the care team to best manage your symptoms. There are many lifestyle choices that you can make to impact your Parkinson's. And we know that many people can live well with Parkinson's for years if you have the right care, the right support, and the right resources. So what is exactly happening? This is very abbreviated, of course, but the nerve cells in the brain that produce a chemical called dopamine are malfunctioning and dying off. The pathology behind this is surrounding a protein called alpha-synuclein. You might have read about this already on your own or heard this before. Um, alpha-synuclein is a protein that we all have. And in Parkinson's, it is misfolding and clumping together and damaging these neurons, these brain cells. And because of this, we're seeing dying off of the neurons and the dopamine um, decreasing as a result. And dopamine is really important for various things such as movement and non-movement um, factors in the body, which we'll discuss. There are other neurotransmitters involved, so not just dopamine, um, but certainly dopamine is the primary focus and culprit of um, the issues. Other neurotransmitters involved are things like serotonin, acetylcholine, norepinephrine. Those are just examples of other chemicals that um, are at play with Parkinson's as well. Briefly, just looking at the numbers, uh, Parkinson's is a worldwide disease. It affects uh, all genders and races. About 10 million people are living with Parkinson's throughout the globe. Um, there are about 1 million people in the United States, and recent estimates are that about 90,000 Americans are diagnosed each year. So that is like a gigantic football stadium. It's a lot of people. And I think the point of sharing these numbers is to let you know, really, you are not alone. I think any health condition when somebody is diagnosed is very scary. Um, and understandably, if you feel like you're alone in that, it could be even more scary. So please know that certainly in your community, wherever you live, you are not alone in this. And it just takes kind of looking around and seeing and asking your care team, how can I get connected? Because there is an active community right um, available to you through the Parkinson's Foundation and also in your local community. So there are risk factors, um, and there are actually more than what's listed here, but the key risk factors that we know of, um, age is one of them. People over 60 have a greater risk of developing Parkinson's than younger. 
although we do see people with young onset Parkinson's, 50 years and younger even. Um, males are more commonly diagnosed than females. So for every female that's diagnosed, about one and a half to two males are diagnosed. So um, certainly we have a large number of females um, um, with the disease, but being male is a greater risk factor. Family history we'll touch on briefly, but that is a part that is looked at and, and will be looked at more closely um, as we understand more about genetics. Um, history of head trauma and then certainly exposures in the environment are some risk factors that we know of. So we don't have a cause yet. Um, certainly there's a complex interaction taking place between uh, genetics, what you're made up of, and your lifestyle choices and just environmental exposures. All of these things, like with any disease, are at play. So we need more research. It's really important um, that our scientists can continue to look at all of these factors and try to help us better understand the various causes of this disease. I mentioned alpha-synuclein is that protein um, that's abnormally misfolding and causing um, damaging of the dopamine producing neurons. So there's a lot of research looking at alpha-synuclein. How can they stop that from clumping together? Is there, is there a way to slow or stop that progression? Genetics, um, in all areas of science, genetics is of great interest. The more we can understand what we're made up of, uh, the better we can diagnose conditions and even treat conditions. So there is a lot of interest in genetics. Um, the Parkinson's Foundation has a national study. It's called PD Generation. And this study is open to individuals um, affected by Parkinson's. It is free and you can go right on their website and take a look at it. Um, but getting involved with genetic research will help us further advance uh, treatments for Parkinson's and understand predispositions um, of genetics related to Parkinson's. There is a lot of research in the gut and brain connection. Uh, primarily, you know, many people with Parkinson's do have constipation. It's a very common symptom. And so uh, scientists have taken a lot of interest, understandably, is um, why the gut slows down and what is the connection between the gut and the brain. So uh, the pathology that I mentioned, the alpha-synuclein protein, they have found that in the gut of some people with Parkinson's. So there is a lot of research looking further into that as well. And lastly, um, environment is uh, a big factor being looked at, such as pesticides, heavy metals, solvents, um, air pollution. And these are not all the areas of research, um, the only areas, I mean. There are many other things being researched, but these are some of the high-level, um, really key areas being focused on. So let's look at the symptoms. What are the symptoms? Well, we call Parkinson's a movement disorder because movement uh, problems are typically what brings someone in to be seen, and those movement issues are what are needed to make a diagnosis. So we're looking at tremors, slowness of movement, stiffness in the joints. Um, it's key to know, before I share any other details about symptoms, that everybody's course is really individual. The symptoms do vary from person to person. Um, typically, symptoms develop slowly over time. So we also know that Parkinson's affects more than movement. So I'm going to share some symptoms with you, but please know that these are things we monitor and look for. It doesn't necessarily mean you will have all of these symptoms. It gives you an idea of what we look for and how we manage these symptoms. So uh, briefly, you know, how we diagnose Parkinson's today is ideally working with the highest trained clinician that you can locate, and that would be a movement disorder specialist. This type of doctor is a neurologist, went to school, medical school, then went into neurology training, and then further specialized in movement disorder specifically. Um, the most prominent movement disorder is Parkinson's disease. So working with someone who is you know, extremely familiar and expert in this area 
seeing it every day and staying on top of the research and advances in the field is really the best care one can get. Um, when you go to a movement disorder specialist or a general neurologist, they're really looking at your history, your physical exam, and your neurologic exam and pulling together the key pieces to make a diagnosis. So we don't have a standard diagnostic blood work or imaging study that is used on everybody to make a diagnosis. Um, MRIs might be ordered by some doctors. They are not required for people coming in for um, evaluation, but if your doctor orders an MRI, that is, that is very common. An MRI does not diagnose Parkinson's disease. What an MRI does is help the doctor rule out other things that um, may explain symptoms. So that's just to clarify, an MRI does not make a diagnosis of Parkinson's. Some people may have an imaging study recommended called a DAT scan, and that is really only approved by the FDA to use when a clinical diagnosis is not clear. So it's not very common that a DAT scan is ordered because a movement disorder specialist, their diagnosis is actually more accurate than what a DAT scan can offer. So that would only be recommended if the doctor does not have enough to support the clinical diagnosis. So the key symptoms that are the motor symptoms, when you hear motor, you think of movement. And these are the four motor symptoms that your doctor is closely looking at with the exam. Tremor, that is an involuntary shaking um, on one side of the body, typically at rest. So it's not when you go to throw a ball necessarily, it's when you're just sitting there and relaxing. It might be the hand or the arm or the leg, but it's a part of the body that's shaking at rest. Bradykinesia is my second bullet point, and that is a fancy word that's used to describe slowness and incoordination of movement. That is a key feature of Parkinson's, so that must be present to make a diagnosis. Your doctor is looking for that in various parts of the neurologic exam, as well as taking your history. Rigidity is described as stiffness. Um, the doctor can actually feel rigidity when assessing the major joints in the body. So I'm going to use my wrist as an example, rolling the wrist around. Often they'll describe uh, the rigidity as a cogwheel, like it's not moving as fluidly as it should. The doctor can evaluate that and determine what is considered normal versus abnormal based on their expertise. And then postural instability. This is describing imbalance, the problems with mobility and imbalance that are um, often seen in Parkinson's. So these are the four cardinal motor symptoms. Your doctor has to see the bradykinesia or the slowness of movement plus at least one of the other symptoms listed here in order to make a diagnosis. There are some other features that I have not listed on this slide that your doctor may ask you about. And these are also additional supportive features of Parkinson's um, disease, and they help paint the picture. I'll give you a few examples. They might ask you if you've lost your sense of smell Commonly, people will have reduced sense of smell or lost sense of smell, maybe even years before they're diagnosed. They might ask you how you're sleeping. Are you yelling out in your dreams, punching, kicking? That is a, a pattern that we see in Parkinson's disease. Again, it could, be, it could be something present years before a diagnosis. It's called REM sleep behavior disorder. They might ask you to write something or ask you about your handwriting or ask you to draw circles. This is a way for the doctor to evaluate um, if your handwriting has changed. It's very common that that's a feature um, that supports a diagnosis as well. Some people might not have an external tremor or shaking, but they might feel an internal tremor, an internal sense of shaking. So that would be additional information that would um, support the diagnosis. One thing as well that your doctor may consider is having you try some medication that is used to support um, Parkinson's symptoms. 
if someone has a positive response to the medication, that further supports a suspected diagnosis of Parkinson's. So as you can see, we're talking about these various symptoms and looking at these elements of the history and putting the puzzle together. And this is why it takes an expert who really sees this every day and can help determine, is this normal or is this considered abnormal? Is this aging? Is this normal for the age of this patient and all the other health conditions? Or is this considered abnormal and features of Parkinson's? And that's why a movement disorder specialist is an expert in this area. I'm gonna briefly talk about what a non-motor symptom is. Non-motor is not movement. It's other symptoms that we see in Parkinson's. And again, I want to emphasize that not everybody has every non-motor symptom that's listed here. And there are other non-motor symptoms that are not on this list. I'm providing you a short list of what we most often see and what we're most often talking to patients about. Um, the non-motor symptoms are significant because everybody focuses on the tremor and the slow movement and the balance. And those are very important symptoms that we can help manage and treat. But these non-motor symptoms are equally as important and they affect quality of life, but we can treat them. We just have to know what's going on with you and help address these issues if you're having problems in any of these areas. So mood changes would include something like anxiety or depression or apathy, which is lack of motivation. We absolutely can help treat mood. We have to just know there's a problem there so we can support and address um, the underlying issue. Thinking changes are common in Parkinson's, so slower thought processes, um, slower getting the information in and slower to respond perhaps, um, not able to multitask as easily as you once did. So these are common sort of thinking changes we see in Parkinson's, and we want to make sure people are aware of that, that there is a level of normal with thinking and slowing down with the thought process in Parkinson's. Sleep issues. I mentioned some people punch and kick and yell in their sleep. And there are other sleep issues that could present like insomnia. So we need to be talking about that because sleep is so important. We want to make sure we're addressing any sleep problems that are happening so you can have your best daily functioning. I already mentioned constipation. It's sort of a universal problem in Parkinson's. And we want to keep that, your GI tract moving at its best, as I'm sure you do as well. So lifestyle choices are a big part of that. And for some people, we do have to do lifestyle choices plus medications, but talking to your doctor about constipation so we can manage it. A softer voice can be common. Some people may have more mumbled speech or softer speaking. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we use therapy to support that. And then about 40% of people might have urinary urgency or frequency. They feel like they have to go to the bathroom really bad. They can't get to the bathroom soon enough. So again, addressing that and openly talking about this with your doctor. And then lastly, dizziness can be something we are troubleshooting. Certainly not everybody has dizziness, but we could see that people um, who do have dizziness, we have to give some specific direction on how to manage that so you don't feel uncomfortable and that you're not at risk for having a fainting or a falling because of it. So these are the common, what we would say are the non-motor or non-movement symptoms of Parkinson's. And we are using the iceberg uh, picture here to show that they're really beneath the surface. They, you know, they might not be so obvious to people just looking at you, but please know they're common. And these are things that if you're experiencing troubles in any of these areas, you should be talking to your doctor about it and going, getting prepared for your visit so that your doctor can help uh, address these and treat them with you. So treatment, a big part of treatment is medication. There's lifestyle and then there's medication. So we'll talk about medication briefly here. Currently the medicines we have for Parkinson's are to manage symptoms. So when we talk about symptoms, if you're having, I'm using tremor as an example, 
not everybody has tremor, but if you have a tremor and your tremor is bothering you and stopping you from doing things you want to do each day, we may have that discussion. The provider will talk with you about medicine may help that. And this is the medicine that your doctor may prescribe and give you specific instruction on how to take that. The medicines today are all trying to influence dopamine in some way. That chemical in the brain that is less, the medicines are trying to influence um, that dopamine and either give you back dopamine that is um, no longer there in a pill or try to keep dopamine hanging around longer in the brain. They all work a little differently, but all the medicine is really trying to do is influence dopamine. And the medicines don't slow or stop the progression. I think that's really important to know. We're trying to help your symptoms and help your daily living with the medication. When people start will vary. So some people will not start medicine on day one and that is perfectly okay. And people might have symptoms for years before they even see a doctor and they might start a medicine on day one. It's very individual. It depends on the person how bad their symptoms are bothering them, um, and that discussion with the doctor, what, the, what they can expect from the medication. So it's individualized, as we all are individuals. So I hope your doctor is treating you as such, and you're having that personal conversation to decide what's best for you. Two key points um, are my last bullets here, is that adjustments are normal with medication. So kind of going in and knowing that at the starting gate is important. So you don't think I'm just going to start this medicine and be on this forever the same way. We make adjustments commonly. People might start medicine early on and have to make adjustments or they might make adjustments three or five years in, but at some point adjustments will be made and that is normal. This is where we have to have open dialogue and a good relationship with our patients so we can make changes with you when you need them. And getting on a good schedule, which is my last bullet, but it should be my first, is really important. So if anything you can do to be involved in your care and make a good choice is Get your medicines in order, not just Parkinson's medicines, but you know we have handouts through the Parkinson Foundation. It's a medication schedule template. And you know, write down all of your medicines. What do you take? Why are you taking it? When do you take it? Um, because the very first thing we're gonna ask you, if you're having any troubles with anything, we're gonna ask you about your medicines. We wanna make sure we understand the full picture of what you're taking and why, because sometimes issues are occurring because of other medicines and we have to make adjustments to things um, and medicines are extremely important to get organized. The timing of Parkinson's medicine becomes more important over the course of the disease. So establishing a good routine early in the disease is really a good habit. So stepping back and getting yourself organized. And when I say a routine, we're talking about establishing a schedule, talking to your doctor about when you should be taking your medicines and then really getting in a habit, you know, setting alarms if you need to, but making sure you're on a good routine and that medicine is taken regularly um, so that you're getting the best benefit from it. So a key part I already mentioned um, in managing your symptoms is really making sure you've got a doctor that is qualified and that you trust and you have a good working relationship with. So the best recommendation, again, is to work with a movement disorder specialist. Um, if you need help finding a doctor, you can contact the Parkinson's Foundation. They have a helpline. Um, the number is listed here on my slide. And they would be happy to look in your area by your zip code to find the nearest movement disorder specialist. Um, some people don't live close enough. And so sometimes special arrangements are made where somebody might live two hours away and see one of our movement disorder specialists, but then we partner with the um, patient's local neurologist or primary care doctor to still be involved in the care and have a different arrangement if somebody lives far away. But the key is you need to find the qualified physician and um, also a team that works with that physician. So I'm going to talk about that on my next slide here. 
So it, the position is really important. And if you see the little blue figure there on my slide, that's the patient in the middle and the patient is key. You know, we can't, we can't do it without involvement of the patient in the care. So um, we would say you and the doctor are the captain of the ship, and then you really want to build uh, a team that's supporting you. So this slide gives you a visual who's on the team, and there could be other people on your team, but these are some of the common um, people on the team. We'll have physical, occupational, and speech therapists. A pharmacist, of course, having a specialist in medication is very helpful, and we, we do have a pharmacist dedicated on our Parkinson's care team. Uh, a psychologist or a counselor can be very helpful. A social worker to help with resources. A nurse like myself to help with education and supporting people along their journey. And then last but not least is family, friends, and the community. Can't say enough about how important it is to be, if you are lucky enough to have a family involved in your care and friends, that is amazing. And if you need help getting connected to people in the community, it's a really important way to stay engaged and feel support um, throughout Parkinson's to know that you're not alone. Whoops, there we go. So I hope that if you're already seeing a, a movement doctor, um, that you've heard the words exercise is, is key. Um, so that is something um, everybody should be recommending and encouraging um, if they're getting care for Parkinson's. We do consider par um, exercise to be medicine um, because it has so many wonderful benefits. Um, there was a study done by the Parkinson's Foundation and it's called the Parkinson's Outcome Project. And they found that people who started exercising early after diagnosis, and they took on exercise for about two and a half hours a week, um, had slower decline and improved quality of life compared to those who started exercising later. So the sooner you can get started with exercise and building slowly on a program, um, the better. And I said building slowly because everybody's starting at a different point. You know, you don't have to change everything overnight, but start to develop a slow, um, steady program that you can build upon over time and hopefully enjoy along the way. So a couple things on this slide. I already mentioned exercise improves quality of life, um, hands down, and it also has full body benefits. We all know going to primary care doctors, um, we should be exercising for our heart health and what's good for the heart is good for the brain. You know, we need to be exercising as well for our sleep quality, our mood, our overall function. Um, exercise also helps to maintain balance, mobility and strength um, for your Parkinson's. So there are guidelines available there's this little picture on my screen. It says Parkinson's exercise recommendations. This is available to download on the Parkinson Foundation website. It's in their PD library. Um, it is the latest guidelines of what's the best exercise in Parkinson's. And it's aerobic activity, some strength training, some balance um, activity, and some stretching. I think the key is here you might not be able to do everything all at once. You might have other limitations, but do what you can do and start to build a program, recognizing the significant benefits that exercise can bring to your Parkinson's care and your quality of life. Hopefully you find things you enjoy along the way. It's an opportunity to try new things perhaps. Uh, like water aerobics um, or rock steady boxing. There's a lot of great activities out there that people explore um, after they're diagnosed. Um, the key also is safety. So if you are not sure, if you are safe for activity or you don't know where to begin, um, we have some ways to support that as well. Um, last note on exercise is it has been found to change the brain. Um, there is something called exercise dependent neuroplasticity. And that means exercise helps the brain maintain old connections and form new ones. So there is some brain benefit there when we exercise and we get our blood pumping. 
Um, there are other uh, positive effects that exercise has been found to show when they've studied animal models, such as mice. Um, exercise has allowed for more effective use of the dopamine chemical um, by the brain cells, and it's had more nutrients and oxygen getting into the brain cells and improved use of energy by brain cells. So there is some evidence that the brain does benefit specifically when we exercise and that exercise dependent neuroplasticity is, is a real thing. So think about how you are boosting your dopamine and helping your brain every time you exercise as well. Um, briefly, I mentioned therapy, and I'm just going to highlight here that there are Parkinson-specific therapists. If you can work with a Parkinson's therapist, that is the recommendation. So there is a website. It's called lsvtglobal.com. You can go on this site, and there's a search uh, where you can put your zip code in and see if you can find uh, physical, occupational, or speech therapist closest to you. So um, this is a great tool um, to see if you can work with somebody who knows Parkinson's, who works with it every day, who has gone and been certified to work with this population. It makes a difference because they really do understand the neurologic aspect. So you're not just exercising, they're incorporating the brain and neurologic aspect into the activities you're doing and understanding this disease is critical so they give you the right guidance um, for exercise, activity, speech therapy, daily living. So if you are not sure um, where to go for therapy, talk with your doctor, look on this LSVT Global website and call the Parkinson Foundation helpline. Um, one thing I like to tell people is think of these therapists like you think of your dentist. You go to your dentist every year to have an evaluation. Therapists are part of your team and they should be part of your team ongoing. Have them check you out once a year. Have them give you feedback and give you constructive feedback on what you could be doing. The more you stay engaged with these therapists, they're going to push you, they will challenge you, and they will get you involved with exercise and activity. So it's a good external motivation as well. So try to engage with therapy if you are not already, and your doctor should be able to place a referral for you if you need to see physical, occupational, or speech therapy along your course of Parkinson's. Um, I'm getting down to the last couple slides, and then we're going to um, have a little conversation. So um, last couple points I want to make is holistic wellness matters. And when I say holistic wellness, we're talking about the whole you, you know, taking care of the whole you and thinking of the things that you can impact, that you can control in this, which often people feel out of control, understandably, with a new diagnosis. So Take charge of what you think you can influence. We would encourage setting some small goals that are achievable. You know, you don't have to make a list of 10 things, but think of a couple things that you might be able to change today. Um, maybe it's nutrition. Maybe it's your sleep habits are not the best and you need to work on improving your sleep quality. Developing that exercise routine, I hope is on everybody's list. Um, there is some research about stress and the negative effects of stress on Parkinson's and how it really worsens all the symptoms of Parkinson's. So stepping back and saying, is my stress beyond a level that I, that's healthy for me? And can I do something about it might be your goal. And don't forget about laughing. Um, it, it might not seem like it fits into this conversation, but truly laughing and hobbies and family, friends, socializing. That's really what hopefully makes life enjoyable for many of us and joy matters and um, staying connected matters. It's, it's a part of social and emotional wellness, um, whether it's Parkinson's or any, any other condition. So if you can carve out time to find laughter and develop hobbies and socialize, um, that is really strongly encouraged, um, especially for mental health. We know that many people are struggling with mental health and in Parkinson's in particular, 
depression and anxiety are common. So these are good tools to fight back. Um, so just take away from here that holistic wellness um, is in your control and, and hopefully your care team is helping um, you work on some of these goals for yourself. I did mention research, but I just wanna say at the very end here, that we're so grateful for anybody who participates in research and we really need research, um, not only the scientists, but patients as well, because this leads to new treatments and new medications. It helps us better understand symptoms and disease progression, and it takes us you know, steps closer to a cure. So if you're interested in any research, you know, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov is a general website. You can search on various health conditions, but put Parkinson's in and find what research studies might be near you. Um, and you can call the Parkinson's helpline as well. But great opportunities are out there if getting involved in research is something um, that you are interested in and it really does help advance us towards a cure. So in conclusion, um, although Parkinson's disease has a variety of different symptoms, again, this is very individual for each person and what they are challenged with. So having the right care team matters and these symptoms can be treated effectively. So engaging in your care is, is key. Um, the symptoms I mentioned vary from person to person. So all those non-motor symptoms that I shared um, doesn't mean you will have all of those, but it brings you, makes you more aware. What do we look for and why? We hope that you are working with someone who personalizes the care. Um, and if you are not, reaching out to the foundation and trying to find that right person. It should be individualized treatment and hopefully with a care team. Like I said, you build a team around you. Make sure you have some of those key team members involved in your care if possible. And then that support network, you know, having family, friends, and community um, ask about support groups in your area. Um, I've learned as a nurse um, that truly this community, the ongoing community that's out there of different support groups and people learning from each other is extremely helpful and effective way to not feel alone in this disease. So um, those are my concluding remarks. Um, I would like to uh, introduce a couple of people who are joining today for a little bit of Q&A. Uh, Ryan Kelly is here. He is, uh, and Dan Royer, both Ryan and Dan are patients of ours at Corwell Health in Grand Rapids. And uh, they're just really great people. Ryan has been living in West Michigan and working and volunteering in this community for I think at least 35 years. Um, he was a former superintendent, superintendent of one of the biggest um, school districts here in West Michigan. Um, and he retired in 2018 from that role. Um, he has since been, you know, spending more time with family, certainly time exercising and engaging in his wellness and really giving back to the Parkinson's community. So Ryan regularly talks with individuals one-to-one -one who are newly diagnosed. He goes to support group meetings and tells his story. He's part of our Parkinson's Advisory Council at Corwell Health. So it's been a true um, privilege to get to know Ryan over the past uh, three years. Uh, Dan as well is here with us from Grand Rapids today and his picture's on the right there with a beautiful dog, Chloe, that I'll let him tell you about. Uh, but Dan is more recently diagnosed. He's been with Parkinson's for two years, uh, but shared he had uh, tremor symptoms a few years before that. And really since diagnosis um, from the start, you know, the doctor reached out to me and said, this guy is pretty neat. You should connect with him, Kelly. And I did, and he is pretty neat because he's such a proactive person trying to embrace Parkinson's and say, I have this, I don't want it, but I'm gonna learn about it. I'm gonna get involved in research. I'm gonna exercise more and I'm gonna engage. Um, so Dan has been involved as well in our Parkinson's Advisory Council and really is doing what he can to be actively involved and share his story um, with others. So I'm happy to have them both here today and we're just gonna chat a little bit and, and learn from people who are living with the disease. So hi, Dan and Ryan. Good afternoon. 
thank you both for being here. I hope I fairly introduced you both and um, just thought we would hear from you since you are living with Parkinson's, who better to share a little bit with the community than people who, who are living with it, who are in the same shoes as our audience members um, today. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit when you think back to when you were first diagnosed, um, tell us a little bit about your main worries or fears and how has, has that played out over time? Um, would you both mind you know, speaking to that a little bit? Sure, sure. I can jump in there first, maybe. Um, I guess my first thought was fear, but, you know, I, I had some worry and a kind of dread, but mostly, you know, as I really thought back about it, it was that I was unhappy. I worried that I'd just be unhappy the rest of my life. Uh, you know, I knew that I would probably struggle through it all and do the best I can and all that. But basically, I was kind of worried that I would wake up every morning feeling like I had bad news that day, you know, and that's just the way it was going to be the rest of my life. I was in Little Lucy's, a cafe here in Grand Rapids, and I noticed when this was, you know, just a week after my diagnosis, and I noticed a man with, looked like he had Parkinson's struggling for his wallet and so forth, and he had just had breakfast with a friend, but I also noticed that he was smiling, and he he didn't look unhappy. Maybe he didn't even have Parkinson's, but I'm pretty sure he did. I thought to myself, if this man with a frozen gait and lunging for the door handle, these are all scary things, didn't seem unhappy, then perhaps neither would I be. And I guess the lesson I took away from that was that other people give us a vision of how we can be in the world and what attitude we can have. And they inspire us and teach us even when they don't even know they're being observed. You know, I never talked to this man, but his, the, the smile on his face inspired me and maybe that made me just think real simply, maybe I can be like that. And it gave me hope that I wasn't gonna be unhappy every day and I haven't been. So that works itself out if, if, that's, the, if that's the way you feel now. My yeah. first thought was uh, when after being diagnosed was for my family and for my children. I was, I was worried about, I won't be able to provide for them. I was worried about you know, my job, my employment. Uh, just, you know, even uh, think of my relationship with, with the kids, you know, would I still be able to connect with them and coach them and that sort of thing? Another kind of crazy thing was my first, another thought was, you know, uh, there's some things I wanted to teach them as, as a father, and I didn't know if I'd still have that time to do that. You know, before I had a chance to really research what Parkinson's was all about, I, I had some worries along those lines. So I'm thankful that over the years, you know, those things have uh, worked itself out and I'm able to, you know, be a normal father like everyone else. I'd like to share too, in case I missed it in my intro, that Ryan has been living with Parkinson's for 23 years um, and was diagnosed as a young onset Parkinson's in his 30s. Ryan, can you clarify how old you were when you were diagnosed? Yeah, I was 34, 35 right in there. And yeah. it's been 23 years now. And yeah, yeah. feel very so, fortunate. Yeah, and a significant point in your life, every point of everyone's life is significant. And certainly though, when you're in your 30s with three little kids at home and working on your doctorate and provider of your family, I mean, that's that's a lot to put on your shoulders. Um, you know, you know, I was diagnosed in Chicago. And so I, the three hour drive there, I, I was thinking, you know, what, what a great life I have. I just got a promotion. I just, I, I just had my third son born. And then the drive home is a little bit different. You know, I was, I was more of a, you know, now what's going to happen now? And uh, I had a little pity party, but I got over that in a hurry too. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, Dan, I wanted to ask you because I think you've been such a such a motivation for learning. And you talked about you see somebody else and sort of modeling, you know, what you've seen in others. And I would say maybe others might see something in you that you've really engaged in learning. And I'm wondering how some of this learning and taking control of some of that has really helped you live your best quality of life with your partner. Sure, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I guess I'm kind of a learner by nature, a, a student, but um, when I was diagnosed with PD, my interest in, in Parkinson's and learning more about it went, obviously went up a lot. I, um, soon after, the diagnosis, I started digging in and reading around parkinsons.org and other places. And I read about some uh, type two diabetes drug that was being tested for Parkinson's. I had to kind of elbow my way into the 
clinical trial, which is another story. But in the end, this year long trial began my this journey I had of learning more about PD through that clinical trial. It wasn't about just getting my blood drawn every month, but I met people that taught me things. I met other patients who showed me wonderful sources for research and books. Uh, I learned about websites. I went to the Grand Challenges Conference in Grand Rapids, an international research conference where most of that's over my head, but I still learned a few things. Uh, I made a lot of connections with people. Um, so I felt more on top of things and better to answer questions from friends. Lots, there's lots of ways to learn, I guess I want to say too. It's not just about reading books or studying websites, but um, watching others with PD, watching, uh, reading their stories, go to parkinsons.org and read my PD story. Go ahead and write one yourself and share that with others. Uh, those are all ways that help us feel on top of on top of things and that we're not just waiting for bad things to happen to us, but we're rather uh, kind of getting, getting ahead of the curve and um, doing our best to feel empowered uh, rather than feel like just victims of bad luck. I was just going to say, it sounds very empowering. And so you said that yeah. exact word, it, you know, it gives you some control or power in, in a difficult yeah. situation is jumping in the deep end and getting involved. Yeah, at first when this exenatide trial I was in, I thought, well, maybe I'm going to get lucky and this is going to be the cure. And I'm going to be one of the first persons cured of this dreadful disease. I mean, it didn't work out that way, but that even that kind of hope is good for you. You know, mm -hmm. it gives you positive things to think about. And uh, it's, it's, all, it's all about who you meet along the way too and, and things you learn. Mm -hmm. That's great. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. And I talked a lot about exercise when I was going through my slides, just how important it is. Um, so I thought I'd open this up to hear from you both how exercise has helped you personally with your Parkinson's and maybe Ryan, if you can kick us off with your mantra um, and tell us about your exercise regimen. So first, yeah, the, the general philosophy is, is you need to move, 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 move. So uh, don't be stagnant. So my, my, my thought is running water doesn't freeze. So, uh, you know, you think of um, whether it's a, a water hose or a, a waterfall in the beautiful upper peninsula of Michigan, um, you know, water, uh, running water doesn't freeze. So um, my, my, what I try to do is I try to do a, a third of uh, cardiovascular, a third of, of weight training, a third of stretching. So I get about 45 minutes to an hour to start each day. And I think those are the three key ones for me that get, get me going and kind of help in all the different symptom areas. So a, a, exercise hits on all of the different symptoms that, uh, symptom areas that we're trying to focus on to alleviate from someone who has Parkinson's. So so I've had great success with that with uh, um, exercise, and I certainly promote that as, as much as I can. That's great. How about you, Dan? Yeah, I guess I'd add to that that just a reminder that exercise is um, really the only thing we have right now that slows the progression of Parkinson's. Where you're going to read around the internet and find all kinds of people claiming this and that can make it go away, and this you know we can mask the symptoms with levodopa and and so forth, but really exercise has some neuroprotective benefits and um, will make you feel better right away. But um, it does take some effort. It's worth it. Um, you know, let's not kid ourselves about that. It's, it's hard to exercise and just like it's hard to diet. You know, anybody tells you diet is, in, is easy. They've never done it. And so exercise is tough too, but you can always start and you can join them. I guess the thing that helped me was realizing that exercise was a social activity. It's harder to do, much harder to do on your own for me anyway. And you can join a neighborhood walking group. Uh, you can get a friend or a running pal. They don't have to have Parkinson's. You just need somebody to be with you. You find a, a neighbor's dog like I did, Chloe, and uh, run with the dog. That's almost as good as a person sometimes. And uh, you just need to get out and start walking and break into a run and then walk a little bit till you feel rested and break into a run again. And if you can just do that every day for a little bit, you'll be amazed at how quickly you improve and how much better you feel after each run. Your brain feels better, you sleep better, and 
something going on in the brain up there is going to protect you and slow down that disease progression a little bit. You'll be so glad you did. Yeah, I love that. I um, can't say enough good things about exercise. And I think you had a really great point talking about for you personally, that social aspect has been an added bonus because we really do emphasize, you know, isolation it isn't good for anybody and it's definitely <laughs> not good in Parkinson's. So even if it means signing up for a class that you don't really want to do, it can get you out and it could kind of hold you accountable and you might actually make some friends and have some fun along the way. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. It's just, it's just good, 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 you know, yeah. and don't worry about what you're doing and it doesn't have to be a official Parkinson's class. Just, mm -hmm. just do something, you know, and um, it, you'll, you'll be so glad you did. Even as simple as something as simple as golf. You know, golf used to be an activity they used to do after exercise. Now that is my exercise. You know, I golf <laughs> and I'm exhausted, but I feel I feel great doing it, and I continue to do that uh, every year. Right, right. I was I saying that. earlier how important uh, other people's examples are, and then just meeting Ryan, you know, and knowing that he's had this 23 years and he's talking about golf gives me a lot of hope and makes me smile because I think, okay, I'm not going to be unhappy the rest of my life, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. And I think we, I think it's amazing that Brian is doing so well. And Thanks, Dan. Well, yeah. Yeah. I joke with Ryan because I'll, I'll message him and say, if we have a meeting about something and he said, well, I'm on the golf course. I'll get back with you later. And it is an inspiration in many ways. Um, because, you know, Ryan, you've shared you've had to adjust, you know, your approach, but you still go and you still have a great time. And I think that is really inspiring and wonderful. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. Um, so also shifting gears a little, we've talked a lot about the importance of mental health. It's really critical in Parkinson's disease and really for anyone because it is prevalent to see depression or anxiety in Parkinson's. Um, Dan, would you mind sharing a little bit um, about some of your experience uh, with anxiety sure. and yeah. how you manage that? Yeah, we're, we're almost out of time, so I'll try to oh, be yes. quick. Yeah. Um, yeah, my neurologist asked me what bothered me the most about Parkinson's, you know, my, my tremor or what, and I said, it's anxiety and this kind of this the OCD in my brain, I keep rehashing things. And uh, it turned out to be, and this is before I even started taking levodopa for the first time two days ago. Uh, but uh, he gave me simply some Lexapro and SSRI and three months later, I felt completely different. And uh, I felt like I'd been living my life with one hand tied behind my back for years. And so I encourage you to, uh, if you feel anxiety and have kind of OCD symptoms or depression or something like that, a lot of times these can be addressed pretty effectively with just really simple medications. I appreciate you sharing. That's a very personal thing to share, but it's so important that we talk openly about mental health and, you know, if somebody's struggling um, to make sure you talk to your neurologist, talk to your care team. A lot of people, you wouldn't be, you'd be surprised that they don't actually bring it up. Um, you know, they don't think that the neurologist would handle it or maybe don't feel comfortable bringing it up but it's treatable and it's medications, there's counseling, there's mindfulness, there's exercise, yes, yes, yes. you know, there's yeah, so somebody many tools. In the, somebody in the Q&A asked about apathy and that again, you know, if they could just bring their, their friend, their family member, uh, convince them that this could be Parkinson's and that there's simple treatments. These, you know, what goes on in the brain with levodopa is very complex, but um, these are SSRIs like Lexapro and others, you know, are well researched and have been used by many, many people with, with and without Parkinson's and can really help. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so I just want to mention, I know it's two o'clock and um, we're okay to stay over a little bit and kind of finish up some of our Q&A. And then if, if people in the audience had some questions, um, be more than happy to take, you know, a few of those as people want to hang on. I know we're a little bit over time. Um, so just briefly, um, you know, we, I mentioned that Parkinson's progresses differently for everyone. Typically it is a slow progression, but we can't predict individual progression. 
So in that, um, there is this unpredictability kind of living in that space of the unknown, right? And that's sometimes a difficult space for people, understandably. How do you both live with that unknown? And how do you manage it and just keep living and enjoying life for today? Well, there's a saying that 10% of your life is determined by what happens to you, and 90% is determined by how you respond to what happens to you. So, so for me, at 90%, I'm going to, for it really the Parkinson's, I mean, I'm going to do everything possible to slow the disease down. I'm going to try to continue to have good days as much as possible. And, uh, and, and I know that means sometimes I have to, I, I can't do it. I wait, I wait, I wake up in the morning and have a plan for it, but I have to have a plan B ready as well if I happen to have an off day with Parkinson's in the bed. So, but, but, um, you know, for example, you know, 90% is how you respond to what happens to you. So I had Parkinson's, I was diagnosed with it. What, how do I respond? So if I respond with a positive attitude, with exercise, with uh, the right diet, all those different things, I know that I'm going to extend my life, quality of life uh, for many, many years. And so I continue on to do that for, for as long as I'm alive. But I want to have a lot of good years left with my family. And I, and I can, I think I, the best way I can do that is by doing everything possible to, to have as many good days as I can. Yeah, for me, how do I handle unpredictably? One word. Lexapro. <laughs> it, uh, again, the same thing. It's, it's just uh, anxiety is something that is, is manageable. But I think on a serious note, I look for inspiration from people around me that have, uh, I try to meet people with Parkinson's and look at, and look at famous people like Michael Fox. He's been such an inspiration to people because you look at his attitude and you think, again, to repeat what I said earlier, why can't I have that attitude? And you can't. Uh, we're not all as funny as him, but we can try. And um, I think it's important to have a vision, you know, to sort of think, how do I want to be? And then work on that. Uh, you know, and the main thing is don't wait for something to happen, bad things to happen. Get started getting a vision that can begin by listening to and reading the stories of others. And again, go, go to parkinsons.org and read the My PD story. There's hundreds of them. They're all short, like 500 words. And look at how people, look at people's attitudes, look at what they're doing and how they're leaning into this. And then write one of those stories yourself, be a part of that conversation and get on top of this thing. Don't just be passive and, um, and wait for more stuff to happen. That's really inspiring to hear. And you guys have wisdom. You're living with this. So this is coming from the mouths of people who are in the shoes of many people in the audience and have made a choice of how to approach this. One thing I've learned from Ryan of knowing you, Ryan, for a few years now, you know, you talk about gratitude quite a bit and how that um, helps you, you know, stay, stay motivated and focus on um, the things you're thankful for and that, you know, you look forward to things. You talk about your kids getting married or grandkids in the mm -hmm. future, but kind of how that helps you um, just stay in the positive. And yeah, I, I want to maintain purpose in life. And so if that means helping my family, helping my kids, helping my community, all those things. And so that motivates me. And I want to have purpose in life every day I have, you know, mm -hmm. forever. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, so, um, I'm just going to check here real quick to make sure how we're doing on time. Um, I do think because we've gone a little bit over, um, we do want to give the audience a chance to kind of ask their questions, which, um, you know, then we can just see how we may be able to support specific audience questions. So we're happy to take any questions that people may have. Great. Thanks, Kelly, for moderating the conversation between Ryan and Dan. I'm just so grateful uh, that the three of you are here to share your experience, which obviously we went over time um, because it's so impactful to hear from you guys. So thank you for sharing. We did get several really great questions from our audience. And again, sorry if we are not able to get to all your questions. Uh, just a quick plug. If you have a question that will not go answered for today's webinar, please don't hesitate to reach out to the Parkinson's Foundation's helpline. My colleagues Laura and or Jenny will post that number in the chat for you guys to follow up with. Uh, so Ryan or Dan, whoever wants to jump at it, one thing that continues to show up in the journey of Parkinson's 
is how we can get our family and friends involved. So I'd love to ask you how your family, your friends, your loved ones, um, your furry friends have supported you on your journey through Parkinson's. Well, I can join in. Um, so, you know, there are scheduled things like, uh, you know, like uh, Kelly will have like a walk through uh, um, West Michigan. So it's a fundraiser. So we participate in those things. Um, there are other, uh, you know, uh, just, you know, my, my kids before Parkinson's, before their dad got Parkinson's, you know, I don't think they even knew what it was, what it was about, but all of a sudden they start, you know, uh, applying for for scholarships and writing about Parkinson's disease. And they won a couple of awards. And so, uh, you know, it's just uh, uh, in the family as well as the whole community, uh, Rockford community, you know, they have, uh, they've offered uh, me to speak every month, just giving an update on my Parkinson's. And, and I take advantage of that. And so, uh, and the community is very supportive. You know, no matter what business you go to, I mean, if they see you struggling, they're going to hold the door open for you. They're going to, you know, shop for you. They're going to do all kinds of stuff. So I think it's a great community. And, and, um, and Dana, you can probably add to that, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a great question. I, I, I think it's so important to be open about your diagnosis. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's, it's something people understand and um, can, can learn about. And it's just been so helpful to me to let my, I mean, I didn't post my diagnosis on Facebook or something like that, though I don't think that's necessarily wrong. It's just not what I did, but I was pretty open with my friends in the exercise community, my neighbors across the street that we like to go out and eat with and that kind of thing. And you know, it doesn't have to be a long conversation, but once they know, even if they don't say anything, you feel supported because they keep going out to eat with you and they keep running with you. And it just takes, it's not fun to have a secret. So it's, I encourage you if you've been hesitant to uh, let in, others in on your diagnosis to just go ahead and do it. It's, it's part of your identity now, it's part of who you are. You might as well be out there and enjoy the support of your friends and family. I'm lucky I have a, a wife that's very interested in helping me build that community. She's done the mindfulness seminar. If you have a spouse or a partner that you want to encourage to do that, that's that's good too. Um, so that's how I would do it. It's just being open and transparent and others will be more open and transparent around you when they see you act that way. Your relationships will be more meaningful. Your friendships will be deeper. Um, it it works. Thanks, Dan, for sharing that, and Ryan for sharing how being connected in your community has impacted uh, your journey with Parkinson's. Kelly, any anything to add, and how family and friends can support us through our journey? Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up because I know with our care team, and I hope at other centers across the country that the family, um, we say care partner, some people might say caregiver, it could be any family member or support person. But when somebody is diagnosed, uh, we know that it impacts the family. So this is a family diagnosis. And we intentionally make efforts to ask family how they're doing. We do screening uh, questions for caregivers and family members to evaluate if they're having any burnout any anxiety. So we can help point those individuals to good resources as well. I know the Parkinson's Foundation has a really great area of their website with caregiver care partner resources. Um, our program does a yearly um, care partner retreat. Uh, we have monthly care partner um, support group meetings. Um, but the key is we recognize that this disease impacts, you know, the say it's a spouse, a husband and a wife, and somebody's diagnosed, that, that partner is impacted as well um, with what does this mean for us and our future together? So making sure we're nurturing and supporting the other person or our family members involved is, is important. And I hope that where people are getting care, um, that your care team is, is asking about family and has resources. And please use the Parkinson Foundation website. Lots of learning uh, um, material and ways to connect if you are a caregiver, care partner, and you need more support. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, really, for all the Parkinson's Foundation plugs throughout our I mean hour and 10 minutes. 
I also want to acknowledge that the Parkinson's Foundation understands that there are people navigating this disease on their own, yeah. uh, whether by choice or by circumstance. So there is a, an entire initiative um, under the Parkinson's Foundation's leadership called PD Solo. And one of my colleagues will drop a, a link to that web page in our chat. Again, that's parkinson.org slash PD Solo. So there are ways you can support yourself by getting involved in the community as Ryan has, attending support groups, getting involved in social exercise classes, um, mm -hmm. also the PD Solo Network. So um, mm -hmm. there's resources for you as well. Uh, Dan and Ryan, I'm gonna wrap up with our final question. We're officially 10 minutes over time and I wanna be respectable for, for everyone's time. Um, but we've also, you know, this comes up time and time again when we host these Parkinson's 101 webinars and it's about motivation. Uh, so we know Parkinson's disease affects our apathy, um, as you alluded to earlier, Dan. And um, many of us struggle with just getting and going to the gym or finding any um, inspiration to get connected at all. I'm curious if you, Ryan or Dan, could share and in, in how this experience might have impacted you and how you've overcome um, the sense of apathy or wanting to stay disconnected from your community. That's a tough question, Dan. You probably want to go first, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it, I guess I'm a social person by nature, so I have that kind of going for me, I guess. But I'm in contact at the gym, especially with people who are not. Uh, you know, you, you can just tell, but you can also pull the, in, pull these people into your orbit and they, they learn to be more social. And so that's kind of the revert, how to get others involved. That's kind of the reverse of your question, but um, how to overcome the apathy, I guess, when you try things and you have success, like trying to make a new friend, you know, it, there's just nothing better than that. And when you make an effort and put yourself at a little, take a little bit of risk, um, you get better and better at it. And you, you realize this is a better, you know, it's a better way to live, to take, have some agency and um, take charge of your life. I mean, it doesn't mean you have to be an, turn into an extrovert, but you do need to take care of yourself and do things that you know are going to help you, and that involve even for people that are good at talking to strangers and so forth, like I am. But you, it's still some risk, you know. Sometimes you meet people maybe you wish you hadn't, but you know that's part of the risk, you know. And um, just put yourself out there as best you can and feel the rewards of that. It's it's important for people without Parkinson's too. You know, we hear a lot about this with aging population, but I think especially those of us with a disease like this, you know, we, we've got to stay connected. You've got to stand up for yourself. You've got to, um, people aren't just going to come walking to your door and asking if you need any help. You need to build the relationships. And that comes by being honest and caring and help, you know, helping others. It's, you start by helping others and then it, it has a way of coming back to you. It doesn't take a lot of time, you know, to, to for example, when I got involved here, I, I, call, I contacted Kelly, I heard her, her, her name, and so I contacted her and she she took me right through, this is what we do and this is what we, how you can help us. And, and so I've been, it's been grateful that, to do that, as well as our home community. I, you know, they gave me the name of a couple of people and I, I just took the initiative to call them and try to find out how I could help and spread the word and bring awareness to this. And, and it's been, it, it hasn't taken a lot of, uh, Time, but just you know, get the courage to go up and talk to people and find out how you can help. Courage, that's a great word. Yeah, I was going to say be brave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Kelly, any last words to offer uh, on this webinar in the time that we have before I do closing comments? Uh, I would just say, you know, we learn from our patients and people living with this disease. And so I'm very grateful for Dan and Ryan to share your stories. And, you know, just hopefully your message, I'm sure resonated with many people here today. So um, 
let us know if anybody has any follow-up questions. It's nice to meet everybody. Thanks for doing this, Krista. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Kelly. And many thanks to all of you who have joined us for today's webinar. As a reminder, a follow-up email will be sent with a survey to provide feedback on today's program. Please let us know what you think. We continue to build and um, change and progress our webinars with your feedback at the forefront of our evaluation. So please take some time uh, to complete that survey when we close the webinar. You'll also receive a link to view today's presentation and other resources on the topics that Kelly, Dan, and Ryan alluded to in the presentation. If you had a question today, we had so many good questions and I'm just, I'm so sorry that we couldn't get to them all, but we, we are out of time. So please reach out to our helpline by calling 1-800-4-PD-INFO or emailing helpline at parkinson.org. You can use that same contact information to order our free resources, educational book series, and our hospital safety kit. We thank you for joining us today and I hope to see you in Zoom land again soon. Bye for now.